Welcome to the Smith Society, a podcast about storytellers and storytelling. I am your host, Dwayne Fernandez. I'm a writer, director, producer, part-time physicist, full-time fixer. The physicist part is very pseudo-physicist, so, but in my mind, I'm very much a physicist. Okay, so I was talking with a colleague last week, and I realized I've actually never shared this story on here, or really kind of this part about the Smith Society. So as many of you know, I like to make it a priority to chat with high school students, college students, uh, to really discuss creativity and storytelling. I focus on how important it is to understand the power of a story. It's a life skill, and uh, it's extremely important for our society that we share diverse stories and we learn how to tell our story. Um, It's also important uh, to understand all the different career paths that one can take to be a storyteller, from pursuing a career as a writer, a director, an actor, an editor, cinematographer, prop master, VFX artist, stylist, from agents to producers, from managers to executives, and oh my god, the list goes on and on. And that's just for film and TV. Think about it. There's so many career paths, I mean, outside of that, theater, the music industry, journalism, marketing, and advertising. There are so many places that need your unique point of view, but the reality is no matter what you do for a living or where you are in your career or in life, the better we learn to understand how to tell a story, tell our story, to share our experiences, to reflect on our journey, the more success we will have at everything in life. We are all storytellers. Your story matters. That's our mission statement at our production company, Your Story Matters. The goal of this podcast is to share personal stories and practical advice that can hopefully help to change someone's circumstance, to potentially change someone's life. I can only visit with so many students a year between productions, so this podcast allows us to share these stories to a much wider audience and really have a much greater impact in communities around the country, and maybe the world, who knows? We're also actively working on course materials for teachers at every level and resources for students, really anyone actually, who's looking to learn more about storytelling. Now let's talk about our guest this week, someone I truly admire for so many reasons. And by the end of this episode, you'll get it. We're going to sit down and chat with the ridiculously talented and funny, brilliant Chelsea Devantes. Chelsea is an Emmy-nominated writer, comedian, director, and actor. Most recently, she was Jon Stewart's head writer for The Problem with Jon Stewart, which she left to begin an overall deal with 20th Century Fox to develop her own TV shows. Prior to that, she wrote for Girls 5 Eva, Bless This Mess, Abby's, Jon Stewart's HBO Project, The Opposition with Jordan Klepper on Comedy Central, and Mike Myers' Gong Show Revival. She is currently writing a book of essays which will be published by Hanover Imprint at HarperCollins, and she's the host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Celebrity Book Club. I'm so excited about this conversation, so let's just jump right on in. What's interesting is that you're a performer, you're a writer, you're a director. Which one of those things did you fall in love with first? Definitely performing because that was the only thing available to me as a as an idea of a job. You know, I grew up um, all over the Southwest and we didn't have TV for good chunks of my life. And so kind of the only references I had was like, oh my gosh, Julia Roberts in a movie. And like, that looked so amazing. And I loved movies so much. And so I really thought the only job available (laughs) was just to be Julia Roberts, I guess. And so I didn't um, learn till much later in life, really just what was possible from writing and directing and, and all the other opportunities available. Following that, writing and director, was that kind of a combination that you fell in love with those kind of at the same time? Or was it writing first? Or was it like kind of directing first? You know, um, when I was in high school, I went to two high schools. At my second high school, I remember my acting teacher wrote me a recommendation letter, not my acting teacher, my theater teacher, wrote me a recommendation letter for college. And um, and I sneaked and I, and I read it. I wanted to see what he had said. And in it, he said, she doesn't know it yet, but she's, she's going to be a director. She's, she's destined to be a director. And I was so upset. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I'm an actor. <laughs> like, and I, I kind of felt like it was, it, I kind of felt like he was saying like, she's not a good actor, but she can direct, I guess. Again, cause I, I just didn't really have a grasp on s- storytelling and, and um, so, anyway, so I remember him saying that and I, and then I, and then I fought it. I fought it for a long time. And so um, we, uh, uh, one, maybe one of the first things I did when I got to Chicago is that, you know, web series were popping up. I'm trying to think of what year this was. You know, this was like 2000, 
between 2009 and 2012. It's like, oh, you know, web series are a cool thing to do. And we're like, we should definitely do one. And I had this idea and we were like, well, how do you, how do you, how do you do, how do you do that? And we're like, well, we, okay. So we know we film it. We just had no idea. And so I, um, I ended up saying like, okay, I'll learn how to do it and you guys be in it. And then we'll switch off. We'll, we'll take turns holding the camera, which obviously never happened. I stayed behind the camera the whole time. But the first episode we filmed, I held the camera, this little shitty cannon in one hand. And I, and I held the manual in the other hand. And, um, and so, you know, so I, I did lots of, now I can look back and see I was directing constantly. I just, but for, from my angle, it was sort of like, I just wanted to get the project done right. And so it took me a long time to, to realize how much I loved it. That makes so much sense. I mean, like, uh, I can see your theater uh, teacher uh, has their point of view because I look at your work and it was instantly like, wow, like you're a th- comprehensive storyteller. Like you, you understand every facet of it from like the concept of an I- original idea, how to put it together and then how to market it and tell it to a wide audience on a variety of platforms, which I think is really, really interesting. Like, you know, your, your website, I could spend all day long there just watching stuff and I can go to the same thing with your Instagram and your Instagram stories. So it makes sense that you have like this bigger picture idea and you've, it, it's an innate to who you are. So that's, that's incredible. Wow. Well, thank you so much. That's really kind. So you came up through Second City. I read that you had, you were on the road. Uh, you performed on a cruise ship. And that right there, I had to like make a note like, okay, so maritime is a whole different thing for performance. Maritime law gets <laughs> crazy. <laughs> How long did you do that for? And what was that like? I did it for four months and it was the most amazing thing I would never, ever, ever do again. Ever. <laughs> it was, it, it, it's like entering the twilight zone. You, you sort of, you're sort of stuck on a mall that goes in the same, you know, we were on the same route. And so you just kind of like go in circles on this, on this ship. And, um, a lot of really messed up things happen on cruise ships and there's a hierarchy to, uh, there's a hierarchy to the jobs on cruise ships that really, really painfully often goes hand in hand with the race and nationality of people on the cruise ships. Mm-hmm. And so as an American performer, we sort of had the the highest <laughs> level of cruise ship, uh, I don't know, cruise ship privileges, as in we could hang out on the top deck of the ship. Wow. And anyone else who worked on the ship could not. Oh, my God. And so it's a really disturbing disturbing yes. industry but maritime law means uh bottles of wine were a dollar and beer was 25 cents and that that really can tell you how i spent my four months <laughs> Wait, was it uh were you doing like kind of comedy performance stuff or was this like theater what was what was the entertainment it it was a uh, second city the second city brand okay. and so second city has Basically, when you perform on their main stage, which is their central theater in Chicago, you write and perform all your own material and sort of the best of that material then goes into this second city canon that gets performed over and over and over again by other performers on touring companies, on on cruise ships. So there's there's these like stock sketches that are sort of, you know, there are ones that are like they're PG or they're kind of. I don't want to say flawless, but like they're they're really known to always do well no matter what. And so we were performing a stockpile of Second City sketches that had been approved for the cruise ship. We were doing an improvised um, dinner d- dinner murder mystery, except it was lunch. Okay. And then we were doing <laughs> improv shows. Um, so we did family friendly improv shows, and we did uh, non family friendly improv shows. And so you performed like five times a week. You had to have learned a lot about the industry in a weird way through this experience. Absolutely. <laughs> what, what, what do you think your biggest takeaway was? Um, my biggest takeaway, I guess, for my craft is I think those are the years when I or that was the time when I really felt like I became bulletproof as an improviser in that you were just performing to such an array of people and such a different audience. And and in Chicago, you're often performing for other performers who are there to also, so, you know, you, right. you're, you're making other performers laugh, especially when you're just starting. And so this was really a, you know, all across America, can you make this wide ranging group of people laugh? And, you know, we failed, I failed just so many times, but I felt like I ended that my time on a cruise ship, having a really good gauge of how to feel an audience and listen to an audience and kind of alter your performance in order to best suit who's in front of you. 
That's amazing. I, I mean, the confidence that it must have given you as a performer is incredible. Yeah, I mean, those 25 cent beers really do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. Uh, what a time. Um, so you're, you're doing this and I'm curious how you bridge the gap from Second City to Los Angeles. How did what what was that path? How did you get there and what was the prompt behind it? Well, um, it was diverted. It was um, it was to New York and then to Los Angeles. And so um, I really couldn't. I don't know how anyone finds a way into this business. If you don't have uh, connections, didn't grow up around it, didn't grow up with money, you know, usually have to have s- something yeah. to get you inside it. And I was like, how, how, how are we getting in here? And um, one of the, one of the opportunities that was always in Chicago is that um, comedians who had agents would be sent packets for late night shows. Mm-hmm. And packets are submissions where you, basically for free, write a a ton of jokes, sketches, whatever, send it to the show. The show decides if you're the type of writer, you know, you can have. And so it was, it was just a very tangible opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes they left the email addresses open. You could, without representation or without being invited, send a packet in and, you know, and then of course you have to be like, maybe they just threw it away. My name's not on the list. Like, I don't even know if I did all that for nothing. And, um, and so I, I had two paths going for me, which is like I I actually had some really early, powerful, incredible success off of another web series. I did so many. I was constantly filming and making web series. And, and one That's of them. Amazing. Really, That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. 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 One of them really uh, took off. And we it, it's such a long story that I I won't uh, bog your podcast down with it. But something very, very painful happened and we almost sold a show and it went away. Wow. And um, and then I had I had nothing. And I was on my third show at Second City, which I liken to being like a ballet dancer when you're 32, <laughs> where they're like, you're going to have to stop dancing soon, sweetheart. You know what I mean? Like yep. there's a we're not going to allow you to be here. And so I knew I needed a job and this packet came through and I I my writing had gotten really, really good great at that point and I put in this packet and uh John Stewart read it and hired me for my very first job wow. um and I moved to New York City to work with him on a show that never came out and then I worked in late night for a little while and then from there I moved to Los Angeles to see if I could pursue my actual dream of writing strong female characters um <laughs> and uh, and making my own television shows and not just working in late night and so that's how I got to Los Angeles that's incredible. And so well, then you ended up working with them later, right? So how did, did yeah. how did that come to be? So we worked for a year on this show that uh, never came out for truly like the technology of what we were trying to achieve. The technology mm. like wasn't ready for the actual premise of the show. I gave my life to that show, you know, and I, and I really um, obviously worshipped him as a, a storyteller, a, a political philosopher, like a comedian, you know, but in person, uh, I just felt so, he's just so incredible. He, 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 he sort of surpassed anything I thought he was going to be. And I learned so much for him. And so I devoted my life to that job. In, I mean, I, I did crazy things to make that job work. Um, including like m- moving to Jersey and like sleeping on the floor of like a, <laughs> I guess we can technically call it an apartment uh, just so I could have more time to like be around the show. Wow. And so, so when that show ended, we stayed in touch and I would send him, you know, my short films and we would talk and we were just, I don't want to say friends. Like we we're like, Oh, we're just palling around. But like, you know, I would talk about work with him and I learned so much from him. And then when he got his uh, Apple show, he, he he called me. I was the first person he called, and he was like, "Will you come back and be my head writer?" Wow. And I was like, "You know, it had been years at that point. I wasn't even late night anymore. I was I was off in L.A. doing other stuff." How did that feel, getting that call? Astonishing. You know, it, a part of it felt like yes, of course. You know, because it's so interesting. There's there's this point in the business where you're just like, I could never be good enough, and I'm such a piece of shit, and I'm so stupid, and I'm so bad. You you have all these like terrible negative thoughts, but if you if you do enough work and take in enough work, there comes a point when you really know your worth, (laughs) you know, where you're like, well, I've read a thousand scripts. So I know the one I wrote is good because I've read a thousand others, (laughs) you know? And so a part of me was like very, very ready for this job and really, really wanted it and knew I could do what he needed and wanted. And another part of me was like, this is the fucking craziest phone call, wrong number. (laughs) Who's this, you know? 
Yeah, well, I can't, I can't imagine. I want to go back to the Celebrity Book Club for just a second because it's so incredible. I know from listening to the podcast, but you can tell the listeners, like, how did this idea come to be? And had you, and talk a little bit about like, did you want, were you looking to do a podcast when you came up with the idea of it? Uh, a thousand percent. No, <laughs> a thousand percent. No, I, I wanted to be the one comedian who didn't have a podcast and I felt very freed by that notion. <laughs> and I also, I think I had a really, uh, incorrect skew on podcasts because I only knew them from all my comedian friends. And there's uh, a, a certain genre of podcast that's really loved, but it's, um, you know, you're sort of like talking, you're just kind of talking and going and ranting and raving. And that's, that's the job of being in a TV writer's room. So I never wanted to listen to podcasts because I was like, I don't need more of this <laughs> happening. You know, this is, this is my life. Yeah. And so, and so I, so I didn't, I wasn't exposed to the really life changing ones. And so, um, I, I have always loved celebrity memoirs. They have meant, uh, it's it's a genre that's really looked down upon. It's seen as like trashy and stupid and not even real books. But for me, they were life changing, like little Bibles that I somehow knew about. And they were giving me the keys to how to live life because it was just all these women being so honest about these things that had happened to him. And it was like powerful women, successful women, even, even the ones that us weekly was like, that's a slut, you know, like <laughs> yeah. it, that, that woman was sort of like, I'm being called a slut in the press. I, you know, and, but that it, she was still a woman trying to exist in this business. And so, I, I mean, they, they meant a, a, a great amount to me and I never shared it because I wanted to be seen as a respectable, smart woman. And uh, I knew people looked down on them. And then one day on a girl's trip, I was drunk in a hot tub reading Jessica Simpson's open book. And I was like, the people got to know how good this book is. <laughs> <laughs> they got to know. And so uh, I started posting um, passages and sort of talking about the book on my Instagram story. In 24 hours, people were like, you have to do a podcast. And I was like, no, <laughs> no. Um, but then I was, uh, people responded in ways that were either like, I also love these books or I can't believe there's this level of depth. And I was like, well, then you got to know what's in the other ones. Yeah. And, and so then um, the pan, this was, this was Valentine's day when this was starting and the pandemic was uh, about to be upon us. And and so then I said, yes, I do a podcast. And then I had to have a real come to Jesus moment with myself. And one of my best friends, Kinsey, helped me through it. But I was like, I don't know how to talk about these books in the ways that are authentic without talking about what they mean to me in my life. And I don't really want to talk about my life mm. <laughs> um, because I feel mo more, most comfortable being a comedian and doing fictional storytelling, right. you know, and and I think because of the pandemic and because of this place I was at in life uh, after enough therapy that I felt safe enough just in my own room with this microphone to start doing the podcast. And um, it's become like one of the most precious things, I think, in my life, which is I know we're on a podcast, but like, doesn't that feel silly to say about a podcast? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah, I read a quote and actually wrote it down here and I was actually gonna bring it up next. It was like, you said, I'm embarrassed to have not realized how incredible podcasts are because doing this podcast actually changed the, the inner workings of my damn soul. And <laughs> I, I love that. And I, I think that that's such a beautiful sentiment because it is, I mean, at, at the height of everyone, you know, like t two years ago, everyone's doing a podcast, everyone's doing a podcast. It felt like weird. But when you actually start looking at it, it's a very intimate experience. And then yeah. especially during the pandemic, <laughs> where it's just you in your office by yourself uh, and then somebody is in an office somewhere else by themselves and you're trying to have a, a, a conversation, it can be it's kind of on the spotlight and it's a lot of self-reflection. There's a lot of like yeah. a lot of vulnerability comes out, whether you realize it or not. Uh, through this intimate experience. So uh, I love that statement. I'm, so, and I'm well so glad you did it because it's the perfect blend of like entertainment and just like beautiful human nature. And so, uh, you're, I mean, it's, it's, that and means I, so much that that comes through. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. And it, from the very beginning. And so, and like, and you laugh, you cry, like it's so good. In your list of recommended podcasts, you've got, you've mentioned one of my favorites of all time, Script Notes with John August and Craig Mason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is, I've been a stan from day one. And I mean, I'm like, I've just, I've got the thumb drives from like 10 years ago. Like I, oh, I love wow. them yeah. so much. Yeah. I was curious. Uh, they made your list that I was curious. What, what do you love about them? 
Well, I'm, I have to go in and out because, again, like I am a TV writer. So sometimes yeah. it's like a little too close to home. But I mean, some of those episodes changed my whole craft. Um, when Craig Mazin did his solo episode on how to write a feature, I think that's one of the most educational episodes ever put out. Just sort of like fuck save the cat. Like here's this podcast episode that that really can teach you how to write your feature. And um and I love how I love podcasts that plan and put time and energy and thought and cadence and structure and I just think this career is taught to people as something you could only get in like very expensive art schools, which is such a lie. And often at expensive art schools, the people teaching it are no longer really in the business and the business changes so fast. And here's these two guys giving you incredible insight that is uh, pertinent and relevant. I mean, it's, it's a gift. Yeah, it's, it truly is. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you love it? uh, You know, for, for, uh, for many reasons, the uh, I've worked in the industry for a long time, and I've learned more from them than I have from any of the jobs that I've had in the last fifteen years. Yeah, and and you know they, you know it's a, it's a podcast about screenwriting and, and, and things interesting to screenwriters, but like it's not like I you know I recommend actors listen to it. I have we have interns that come through our company every year, and I'm like, here's your required listening script notes. Uh, Absolutely. Check, check that and read the trades on a daily basis and let me know what you find interesting so I can learn more about your personal taste. But like script notes is like required listening to at our company because it is just so informative. And John's thoughtfulness around like building this empire, <laughs> you know, like they've got yeah, the book coming out. Yeah. It's like, and Craig's ability to drop in and just be Craig. And, and then when he comes in unprepared, unlike John, and then he just drops like knowledge, whether it's from like, League, like business affairs or like from the WGA or for practical, like for accounting, like whatever it is, like you just learn. So it's like practical advice that anyone can walk away with. And I'm always drawn to teachers. Like I've, I find whenever I find somebody interesting, I find out they're the type of person that's willing to share their craft with the world. They're not like hoarding it and saying, yes. oh, this is mine. I don't want anyone to know how I do this. I love people. And you're very much the same way. By the way, I was telling somebody earlier today, like on your one of your, your, your sagas, like at the very end, like here's the bullet points on how to do this. Like I love that. And John's very much that way. Craig's very much that way. So I, I, you know, my dream is just like, I just want to sit at dinner with them and just watch them like a child and just yeah. see John and Craig like outside of the podcast world, have a general conversation. I, I want that. <laughs> I, I totally agree. You know, it, I always, that, that thing about sharing knowledge and, and sharing uh, what you have to give. I always think of this episode on RuPaul's Drag Race where Bianca Del Rio um, is just giving away these, uh, I think, hip pads, you know, and, and or she's helping them make them. And Ru comes on and she's like, Bianca Del Rio is, is actively gifting people things that they need to win because she's not insecure about what she has to give. And she knows that like others shining, like don't take away from her because she's that solid in her craft. And I always feel that like, if there is someone who like, you know, where you do feel like, Oh, I'm hoarding information or I don't want you to succeed. It's like such a sign that you need to become more whole in who you are to the point where you can just be like, this, what I do is great and it can't be taken from me. Right. And more people joining will only make this very toxic business <laughs> yeah. less toxic. <laughs> yeah, you have to. You have, if you want to create the change, you have to give people the tools on how to do it themselves. Because like, otherwise, people believe that, oh, I've got to go to a fancy school to get into this industry. And that's a little bit like the premise of what we're trying to do is like, you know, go create a program that can go wider to educational systems because there's so many jobs within the entertainment industry that people aren't aware of. Like, you know, but most people think it's like actor and directors, like then it just keeps going and going and going. Yeah, And, yeah. and it matters. Like when you look at a, when you look at a, a crew or a call sheet and you see just diverse names and now look, I'm like, Oh, this is just a wide variety of genders and types of people. Like this is going to be an amazing project. I can always, I can tell immediately. And yeah. you know, What's interesting is that like Fortune 500 companies have started have realized that like 10 years ago and have like adopted a lot of inclusion and diversity tactics. And our entertainment industry is like still like apprehensive around it. Like, well, there's a lot of archaic ways for you to prove that you're you're good at what you do. Like, do you have a comp? Like, do you have a like, you know, what have you done? And you can show them your resume. And it, but if there's not a, a, an immediate comp, it doesn't mean anything. And so how do people who aren't represented in the jobs currently get comps? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, absolutely. So well said. I can stand on the soapbox all day long. Um, I would love it. <laughs> I want to talk about basic. What a beautiful short. 
I watched it uh, last week, and I watched it a couple times this week, and I tried to like break it down. I actually kind of did a little beat sheet for it be- just because I was curious. Oh my gosh, but I love this! <laughs> it's such a a wonderful short. I'm fascinated by shorts. It's a medium I think that uh, isn't utilized enough in the entertainment industry for like development purposes and developing talent. It's a great resource, and yours is uh, is like the the master class of doing a short. The, the time frame, the production, the writing. So uh, I was curious from like a producing standpoint, why did you one, make it? And then two, how did you decide on that story? Um, so first off, thank you for saying that. And um, uh, for anyone listening, the short film is three minutes long, which I want to, I, I feel so proud because it's hard to tell a story in three minutes, but also just as a hot tip, it it did so much for me in my career simply because when you send something you say it's only three minutes almost everyone watches Mm -hmm. but if you send something and you're like this is 10 minutes 13 minutes this is half hour almost no one watches Mm -hmm. (laughs) so and and so that part ended up being like a very surprising like wow damn y'all really only have three minutes huh but wait that wasn't strategic you 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 know just okay no, no. So um, very frustratingly, I have made some type of film projects every year for the past 10 years, whether that's a web series, a pilot presentation, an actual sizzle reel to t- try and sell something like I, I have always uh, made something and usually I have a lot of goals for it. So in the most in recent years, I've been filming TV sizzles for a TV show I've been pitching. But then I go out and film like a bunch of what, you know, the content Mm -hmm. is going to be and all these things. And they weren't they didn't go. And and it would it was heartbreaking. And so much goes into making something like that happen. And so I reached a moment where I realized I hadn't made something in my for myself um, in in a long time without any pressures on it. And so I had had this idea come to me, had, it had come to me in an instant. And I was like, but what's that for? What's that? I, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what that's for. And then I had another moment where I was like, who cares what it's for? I'm just going to make it because I love it. And so, um, so I made it, you know, I, I wrote it in a night. I set up production that week. We filmed it two weeks later, editing was done three weeks later because it was just on my timeline, you know, yeah. and, and it was just for me. Then I, then I was like, now what do we do with it? I think, I think it's so great. I love it. You know? So I was like, I guess I'll submit it to festivals, but I hadn't studied that process because again, I, I was, I was in the TV world. And so this is how, and, and I'd be like, what a gift. I can't believe this happened. I, I basically applied to film festivals the way you're taught to apply to college, like community college and Harvard. Like you just kind of like, you got to hit all your options so that someplace says yes to you. So I hit, I mean, I did, I just applied to everything and a film festival came through that was actually like pr- pretty great. And I was like, they're like, we want to premiere it. And I was like, great, you could have it. Uh, yay. We got into one of them. And then two hours later, South by Southwest emailed me and they said, you, you've gotten in. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, thank you so much. Um, I just told this other festival, they're going to have the premiere though. A- and they, they didn't know what to do with me. They were like, but d- d- what, what? No, 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 that's not how this works. And I was like, what? And, uh, and they were basically like, why did they said, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you call us to see if you were going to be accepted? I was like, why is how in the why in the fuck would I call South by Southwest? I didn't even think you'd open the application. Yeah. And so and you know what? I, I, I still premiered it at the festival that I wasn't supposed to. I decided I would close out the film at South by Southwest. I did every festival from the elite ones to the ones that uh, shouldn't have be allowed to exist. And we were going for our closing festival date at South by Southwest and the pandemic hit. And had I waited, I never would have got to see my film in front of audiences. I never would have gotten to get the response and the response from real people watching it and from putting it online, which I did immediately because it was the pandemic and I had already, I had already debuted it, um, is what turned it into a feature film. And it all came from just doing it for myself, which I have to say is very frustrating for someone who (laughs) I've had so many goals and dreams and there was like, just do one for fun. And then like, that's the one that goes, you know, of course. I mean, that, of course that happens. And I love course, that, that <laughs> you're able to see it with people. And uh, that's how kismet. That's amazing. So that was you wrote it that night. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you know how sometimes you get 
you can, I, I can feel, especially because I work in TV where you're just constantly, constantly, constantly writing, you can feel the difference between like uh, the divine has hit my brain and this muse idea is within me. Like it just mm-hmm. comes. And then the majority of the time you've got to force it. And those ideas are, can also be great, you know, but you can, but that was one idea where I was like, this is, this is something special. And it just hit it once. It's very visceral. Like you can feel it and your heart rate's kind of going kind of fast and you're, you're, you're happy and endorphins are all firing. So there was no strategic, I mean, like, is that tonally the types of shows that you want to make? Is that like, I was curious, a lot of times, you know, reps will be like, go shoot the short of the thing that you want to be making. Is that really in line with the thing that you want to be, that you're you're actively doing already? I mean, I was, uh, yes. I mean, I I will say because it was for me, it was the thing I most want to be doing where I I really like, um, I really like. Uh, storytelling that has turns and tw- uh, twists. I like a lot of storytelling movement. I'm not a big fan personally of movies where it's just kind of, I don't know, you kind of feel like you're in, a, in the ocean, you're floating. It's nice. I don't like that. I like big, strong, intense moves. But I also like talking about the stuff that is like very r- real to me. And like, I, I kind of love that perfect blend of something that is maybe seen as like silly and trite and feminine and bringing like the depth of art to it and putting it in one. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it had like it had these little moments of like paranormal thriller. <laughs> I'm like, this is kind of, <laughs> like, I, I like that it got dark. I like the camera movements. I love like the start, the shuddering. Like I thought that it was a really fun uh, piece. So bravo again. Well, thank you. So I first heard about Chelsea Devantes in February of this year in the trades when your overall deal was announced. And, you know, I'm like, wait, who is this person? And then I just look <laughs> at like I'm reading through and I'm like, and I remember like the note and there being like a rising star. And I'm like, yeah, no doubt. Like this came out of like ah! nowhere. Like so much had transpired. Obviously, it doesn't come out of nowhere because you had put the time in. It's not like, oh, you just tripped onto the scene and stumbled into success. You had, as we've talked about this in our podcast, you've done the work and you have been doing it for a long time. That's also a good part of who you are. With that announcement of that deal, as you're going into these conversations with studio executives and you're pitching, what is your point? Of, like, what is your goal? Like, if it, with something like this, what is it that you hope to accomplish with a partnership like this? What, is, what are some of your personal goals over the next few years? Yeah. Oh, I'm such a great question. Also, it's funny because, uh, that deadline, whoever wrote up that deadline announcement did their own um, pontificating. I think they wrote in to the deadline like she has had a rapid rise in Hollywood. And I was like, that is so funny. I have been here for 15 years. Um, and and it was also very uh, I, I found it to be very gendered, too, where I was like, I was like, you've literally listed my credits. You can see <laughs> that I've been here for 15 years. Like, what part was rapid? Um, because I would have loved to have had a rapid rise uh, <laughs> and, and didn't. So. Well, what they do is they go look. I mean, just like, you know, executives have never heard of you before. will go look and like Google you and see how many trade articles you have. And if you haven't had any, then you're not working in Hollywood. And you're like, that's insane. You know, like totally. there's totally. it's a very archaic it- way of thinking about this business. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, you know, the first show I was ever on for a year with John, like never even came out like that's not on IMDb. And then the 10 years I spent um, making my rent off of being a comedian, um, that's not in there. And then also all of the short films and the festivals and the times you come close. And so, yeah, absolutely. It, but it, I mean, that being said, I, I was so thrilled to, you know, have that article. And with this partnership, I am, when I was the head writer on John's last show, we changed the hiring process in a way that I'm extremely, extremely proud of. And it actually like ended up going like viral at the time. And I always knew how I thought the late night hiring process should go because I knew how fucked up it was and I tried so many times on my own. And so um, we did all these things that I, I won't bore you with, but we we please bore me with because <laughs> there's a lot of interest. I mean, we had, there's a lot of in, like, uh, executives and studio folks that listen to this. And I think that some of them are like, just don't know. And like, well, how do I make change? And I have convers I have lunch with them and dinner with them. And it's like and it's like, oh, this is how you do it. So, no, like, uh, please let me know. Um, Well, you know, so the things that really made a difference were um, we said you had to self-submit and that it could not come from an agent or manager because uh, we wanted everyone to know that their packet would be read and valued. And we wanted to encourage people who did not have representation to put in a packet because there are so many talented comedians out there who have not been signed. 
And that is why the hiring pool on late night shows often looks very similar because that's what what the client list looks like. Right. And so um, and, and I knew from being a comedian that like you did not have to have credits to be a genius writer. You, you, you know, you just you just have to be a genius writer. And so we also made um, the first packet only one page long because often these packets require an amount of work that is truly impossible while working another job, which so that means only yeah. rich kids can apply. People who don't have to work can apply or you can apply, but your packet isn't as good as the others because you right. have a job. Yeah. Um, and then. The other thing we did is that there's a certain um, there's a cer- certain formatting for late night shows. It goes into this uh, basically the software that that puts it out. And so you have to know how to format the late night packets. But when you're starting to learn that for me, it looked like a different language. You're just like, wait, what? Like, there's just so many weird things and so much research. And so we pulled all that out. You did not have to previously know the formatting. Again, that would mean only people who had experience in this or had a friend in the business would know how to do that formatting. And so we removed all those things. um, And we did several other things. And then I sent it out through comedy channels. And I said, pass this on to to anyone. Pass this on to anyone who thinks they can do this. And um, it was one page of, of late night jokes, um, monologue jokes. So, which really is kind of like 10, 10 jokes. And I said it had to be, um, topical. It couldn't be evergreen. So it couldn't be like a joke in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. And I said it over a holiday weekend, which means there's only, it's like usually slow news weekend, which means you really have to work hard to be a good joke writer. Yeah. And we got 2,400 submissions. And I read every single one of them and um, other John, other people read them and we read them blind. That was the other big thing. So everyone's name was removed. And then um, I'm, you know, I, I got nervous at the end. I said, what if I'm about to unmask seven Harvard Lampoon male writers and I have to <laughs> run through a plate of glass <laughs> because yeah. at, at that point, the packet was being posted on Twitter. It was posted on Reddit. Um, uh, news organizations were picking it up. So at, at this point, it's like, oh, everyone's going to watch and see what happens. And the room looks exactly like America looks. Oh my I'm God. talking I love everything. It. And there's only seven writers. The Southwest is there. The South is there. The Northwest is there. The Midwest is there. The East Coast is there. Lower class, upper class, every gender, every. And like, granted, there's so many levels of diversity. There's, there's obviously a million things missing, but the, our room looks like what a comedy show looks like when you go into a comedy show. Like, and I think five or six of them were not repped. And um, five of them or six of them had never worked in, te- in television before. And they're they're just incredible writers. They're so good. And in that process, um, an exec from 20th who I had had a pilot with them, Steph Gruber reached out to me. And she said, if you found anyone great who you didn't hire, will you please pass them on? I want to meet them. And there was a writer who had been um, who I'd been in touch with because my fian- he had he had basically asked my fiance for writing advice on Twitter. Oh, so I kind of knew him through that. His packet had gone into the top round. Someone with no experience. Um, he worked in a factory in Indiana. He met with the exec at twentieth. Um, she was like, "He is so good. He deserves." I, and she read a script. He was like, "He deserves an agent." She set him up with an agent. He now writes on Bob Hart's Abby Shola. Wow. And he did it on Zoom at first from Indiana. And he's had like little news stories written about him. So I'm not saying anything that's like not already right. public knowledge. And so <laughs> to answer your question, when I was coming into this deal with 20th, I knew that they cared about the things I cared about because they were helping writers who deserve to have uh, jobs and who are incredible writers uh, get get jobs. Wow! And so, so yes. Yeah, so you had seen it in action. You literally <laughs> saw them like yeah, do the eff- make the effort and actually fulfill it. So that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and and I didn't even work for them at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I just knew them from a previous pilot that I had had, and. I also knew from um, the first pilot I had with them was based on my life and it dealt with themes that I'm always going to be trying to write about, which is um, growing up broke, poor, low income, working class, blue collar, whatever you want to call it, um, single moms, um, domestic violence, uh, all the comedy buzzwords. Um, and and um, I'm also from all over the Southwest showing that part of the country. 
And so they knew those were the types of stories that I really wanted to tell. And so that is still the goal. Those are still the stories I'm trying to tell, um, female friendship stories, um, all of that. And then separately, I also presented to them other goals I have for how I want to um, hire, for what I want the and like the environmental, um, like having an environmentally forward set look like. And so those are goals down the line. But I came to them with like, here's what I'm about. So don't tire me <laughs> unless you like it. <laughs> I think that's smart. I think that's incredible. Bravo to you. I think that um, I knew there was going to be a good answer to that, all of that. So I know, and, and, <laughs> so thank you for sharing the, the advice, especially around the hiring processes, because I mean, I, I'll have that conversation with executives. They're like, well, I don't know. How, how, how else do I do it differently? And I'm like, there's so many different ways. <laughs> Let me there's try so to show you. There's so many different ways. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's so interesting, too. It's like I am a, uh, I, I am a television writer. I am writing a book. I don't know commas. I missed them in school. We moved around. I missed it. I just missed it. But that doesn't take away from my worth as a human or my talent as a writer. And I think like certain little markers like that, that people get discounted and it's, it's like, it's classist, you know, without even realizing it. And, Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yeah, no, I agree. I just wanted to share fuck commas. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Listen, as somebody who always forgets to use them, I, I'm with you on that. Uh, especially like Oxford commas, don't even get me started. So I mean, listen, I keep trying to learn, keep trying to learn. <laughs> that was such great advice. So thank you for sharing that. Through that process, you you had to learn how to be a pitcher, right? Like you've had to learn how to pitch an idea, pitch a joke, yeah. pitch a business, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, do you enjoy that? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love 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 performing i love performing um i think sales no not i'll never be a fan of sales what (laughs) no i don't even like when someone's selling me something and so um the part of the business i love is the part where i get to make my art and the part of the business i hate is when i have to convince someone that my art is worthy and Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know which way, but like I I was a live performer for so long. And also now with the podcast, I can really feel in my hand what works. Like Mm -hmm. I just I I have been with the audiences as they laugh at things that um, other people might say is not good art, but it it, because you're just not in touch with them. And so um, it's painful when people have certain markers of like well, this demo likes this or this storytelling, this or no, you cannot have um, uh, women on the run from a domestic violence abuser in a comedy. Well, you can. I know you can. And mm-hmm. and um, so, yeah, so that part, I think, is very hard and um, feels a little soul crushing. Yeah, it's it is uh, the hardest part. And you're it's the one that you do all, the most. <laughs> you're you're Absolutely. constantly pitching <laughs> actors to be a part of your thing. You're p- pitching executives to do this thing. You're sometimes pitching investors. It's It's constantly pitching. And coming from the performance side, like I, I, I've always said, like I can never imagine being a performer. Like I can, I can handle being turned down in business pitches, but I, like the, the whole acting thing where you walk in and you're like, oh, I don't like your look. Like, oh, I don't. That's yeah. tough. I can't handle that. Um, it's, it is really tough. But you know what? That's also the nice thing about making your own work. And my favorite part of making your own work is because that's it. It's actually done. Yeah. So if you like that, <laughs> thumbs up, you know, and yeah. if, versus like me telling you that it's going to be good. Right. It's so nice to just get to make something. Yeah. Well, you, you've done the work. Um, quick inside baseball question. So when you write an outline, are you a whiteboard index card or a story clock person? Um, <laughs> no, I'm not on the story clock. And I do think formulas, uh, while you should know them from front to back, can also harm you. Um, I am a whiteboard person. Um, um, and it's chaos and then I move it into structure. What advice do you have for somebody coming into one a writer's room? Like from your experience, like as you know, you're bringing on, especially you all have brought on people who weren't even in the industry necessarily. What was your advice to those people as they were coming in? Um, well for anyone who is like a writer's assistant or a staff writer, or maybe you're like very new to the room and it's so nerve wracking and overwhelming. The advice I always give is say one banger thing a day just one just one if you have one killer joke a day you are on the track to being promoted and moved up because people underestimate one that it that it'll be a banger but two like one is enough especially if you're in one of those positions where you know you're not carrying anything so say say one incredible thing a day one incredible pitch what just one and then um 
I think otherwise, if you're like really in the room, it would be uh, study, study before you get here, whatever show you're on. All of the show, all of the shows like it, all of the scripts like it, like just be so ready. Um, and the other one would be to be a great joke writer because it's um, it's really rare and it's a skill set that even if you're bad at everything else, if you can write jokes, you'll probably always find work. Wow. That's great advice. We have three quick questions, I think. Yeah, three quick questions. Do you believe in ghosts? I believe in energy. Um, it's funny. I'm on a show right now that's about ghosts. <laughs> so this almost feels like a trick question. <laughs> um, no, I, be- I believe in energy and I and I and I believe I believe in um, spiritual energy and 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 being there and not being there when you need it and not need it. But no, I don't believe in uh, the classic <gasps> Casper falling in love with Christina Ricci ghost. <laughs> Uh, imposter syndrome. Are you, do you have it? And how do you, if you do, how do you manage it? And if not, what do you think of it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I have definitely had imposter syndrome, um, for sure. I, they, I don't know how you don't, I tend to, I have imposter syndrome currently with very personal, uh, meaningful things in my life that, uh, that it cripples me and crushes me to like, I have imposter syndrome about existing as a human in the world but when it comes to work no I do not and that uh, that because it honestly comes from doing so much and taking so much in I I know I know (laughs) I I know I know what I'm bringing and what I'm doing and and I'm not uh you can't tell me I'm not because I've seen it happen yeah I think also that comes from being a comedian where like laughs are very tangible so you're getting them or you're not getting them, you know, and if you're getting them, that's it, man. <laughs> and, um, and so, no, but man, I, I do wish I could switch some of my imposter syndrome in my personal life to my uh, <laughs> career. You know, there's a clear roadmap to your career and what success looks like and wins in, in your career. It's really hard to see wins in your personal life sometimes. And yeah. more importantly, it's harder to uh, know when to celebrate them and how to celebrate them. Um, so, yeah. Great it, point. It, and I think in your career, you slowly, you know, you've had a long career. You've you probably had it early on and then you've learned and now you can look at your resume like, look at what I've got. I don't need to I don't need to question what I can do anymore. And the same thing with life. It's hard to look at your life resume <laughs> like unless you're auditing Absolutely. yourself every year. Right. And Absolutely. all the things that you've done for society and in service of people. And they're like, oh, look at that. I've done a lot of great things, which you probably <laughs> should do. You have done a lot of amazing things. And I'm curious when you look back at what you've or what you have accomplished, what are you most proud of? I'm really proud of that very first web series we did. I, I go back and I there's just so much magic when you are starting out and you just have so much belief and passion and desire. And I think that's maybe when the most magical ideas are present. They haven't been beaten out of you. I'm, I'm so proud that I learned how to just pick up a camera and I'm proud I like p- got something down, you know, um, and, and, and I learned to edit just to get it up. So I, I'm really proud that I can like go back and see my early forms of, of work. Um, I'm really proud that for all of the uh, intense, constant, nonstop fuckery in this business that I kept walking and that I. I think I'm most proud of the friends I made really early on because those women have walked through this career with me making their own paths and it's really kept me whole and kept me sane and kept me, I think, a good person. You know what I mean? I think you can get so so ruined, so bitter, so sad, but if you have a community, it's like the most beautiful thing you can have and I'm just so happy that I was able to build one uh, very young. That's beautiful. I, as I was reading, that you you consider New Mexico home. Is that correct? That is. I was not b- uh, born and raised there, but it's where my mom has been for the past twenty years. Yeah. When you go there, uh, I'm a big fan of New Mexican cuisine, food. Ah, oh, so good. Do you have a spot in mind that you are that you're fond of, that you love? Tomasitas always cheese enchiladas Christmas. Deal done. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go there immediately. <laughs> uh, we did this epic road trip uh, in July through Santa Fe, through Albuquerque, Flagstaff, Sedona, New Mexico. It was incredible. And 
I was so amazed at how truly beautiful, because I had not spent a whole lot of time in, in New Mexico, how beautiful every element of it is. It's a really yeah. beautiful state. It has a really intensely spiritual energy to mm-hmm. it that I think cannot be found other places. Yeah. No, I think you're 100%. And it's a, it's a cool vibe. I like the grittiness of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like Phoenix where everything's brand new and polished and like this feels weird in the middle of the desert. Like, oh, no, yeah. we are we are number 50 in education, number 49 for opportunity, number one in drugs. We are a state that needs resources and deserves them. And also, I think it's a little bit untouched and unfound in, in, in that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like at least the entertainment industry has grown quite a bit. So that's might yeah, be a good ne- resource. Netflix bought some big old lots out there. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what that's done for just downtown alone. Uh, what's your comfort food? You're having a bad day. You're exhausted. You come home and you're like, I just need this. What is that thing that makes you feel better? Uh, Taco Bell potato tacos. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so delicious. <laughs> so Such good. a good choice. So good. <laughs> um, well, I did so much research on you and it just kept, as I, it was like a, a, a blooming onion. Every time I pulled back one fried layer, I found something beautiful in the next one and I had to keep going and keep going. Like I said, last week I was like listening to an episode here and there. And then last three days of just like was binging. And this morning I listened to your ask me anything podcast. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, that is such a powerful story. And I'm an advocate. The whole point of this podcast is people need to know. I want everyone to know how to tell their story, whether it's singer, songwriter, whatever it is, an artist, like telling your story because telling your story matters. Like I believe that. And the story that you shared, uh, I can't imagine sharing that. And I can't imagine that, like how hard it was just to put that into words and then to share it into a podcast. And, uh, but thank you. Like it was, uh, you've, I can't imagine how much of an impact that you have in the world by sharing that story. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything that you do from hiring practices, your podcasts, the things that you, the stories that you tell that's in the way in which you do them. So uh, yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's an honor to sit down and talk with you. Well, that really, um, that you just made me tear up. (laughs) Um, And, and, you know, I, just the last thing I'll say is that um, coming to a place where I could do that is the part that like kind of made me feel like I could be myself for the first time. And so your work of like telling your story and and teaching people how to tell their story, it's just underestimated how um, life changing it is for the storyteller and for the people hearing, because when, when I read these celebrity memoirs and I would read about the really intense things in them, it made me feel like maybe I wasn't like the monster that I felt like I was inside, you know? And so um, thank you for your work and in, in, in teaching people how to do this. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast. I cannot wait to see all of the stuff that you do this year, next year and beyond. Thank you. All right. <sighs> I absolutely love Chelsea, and I appreciate you all for taking the time to check this very special episode out. I highly recommend you following Chelsea on Instagram at Chelsea Devantes, as well as checking out Celebrity Book Club wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also check out our Instagram at The Smith Society Pod for latest news, events. We're doing giveaways this holiday season and hopefully doing some fun, exciting things for 2023. So be sure to follow us there. And finally, the best way you can support us is to rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow your dreams, no matter where they take you. Thank you so much.